Good morning and happy Easter. Man, what a great day to be here. We are excited about today and about what God is going to do as we celebrate the greatest day in the history of the world. 
uh, and that is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. So uh, if today is your first time here today, man. We are excited that you came and joined us uh, on Easter Sunday. Uh, if you're watching online, if you're joining us online, welcome to church. Welcome to Connection Church. Uh, if it is your first time, I'd love for you just to do one thing for me this morning. And that's pull out your smartphone, just real quick, pull it out and text the word NEW to 706-979-2438. And uh, we've got a special gift just for you uh, when you do that, but also that's not all that happens. So when we do that, when you do that, excuse me, uh, we're gonna donate $5 in your honor to an organization called A21. And what A21 does is they combat human trafficking around the globe. And so right now, today, just by texting the word new to our text number, 706-979-2438, you are making a difference around the world uh, in helping free people uh, from human trafficking. So we thank you so much uh, in that. Man, what a great day to be in the house of God. We're gonna sing some songs and we're just gonna worship Jesus this morning. So I wanna invite you just to stand up with me. And as we sing, just this morning, let's, let's just don't hold anything back because this is, this is the day where we don't, do, we don't hold back, okay? And so, so let's, just, let's just go after it uh, in, with everything we got this morning. Can we do that? All right, here we go, let's go. Thank you. 
There's a sling in my voice and a stone in my praise. Pushing back when the darkest weapons fall. There's a power on my lips, even death can't defy. When the name of our God is lifted high. There is resurrection how when we sing the name of Jesus resurrection power when we raise a mighty sound so come on let the praise get loud make that empty grave resound there is resurrection bow in his name there are days I have seen
Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, good morning again, and uh, man, happy Easter. What an incredible time just to be together and to worship uh, Jesus this morning. You know, here's, uh, we've been in a series called Creed, and we're learning step-by-step uh, and step, uh, teaching kind of the Bible through the Apostles' Creed. And what we're learning is uh, kind of like um, your body, uh, there's really no unimportant part of your body, right? Like there's things that we can live without. Like we've all heard like what, what good really is the appendix, right? But, but when, you, when it starts to get a little infected and, and stuff, you know it, right? And so it's, it's, it's important. It, it serves a function, but there's parts we can live without. Like we can, we can cut our hand off, right? And we can still live. We can cut a leg off, we can still live. But there are some parts you cannot live without in your body. Heart, right? A little, it's a little difficult to live without a heart. At least last time I checked. Uh, your brain. You can't live without your brain. And so what we're doing through this series is we're looking at the parts of our faith uh, that you can't live without. And so what we've said in this is that this is not a replacement for Scripture. This is not a replacement for the Bible. This is simply just us using the Apostles' Creed to teach the Bible. And we've said that, that the Apostles' Creed is, is good for us to be able to correct heresy in our lives and in others' lives. And, and we've also said that it's, uh, it can be used to aid in persecution. And so today, on Easter Sunday, we're going to look at the part of the Apostles' Creed that says he descended to the dead, and on the third day, he rose again. It's almost like we planned that, right? It's kind of funny, right? So, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. If you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen for us to look at. This is uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says this in verse one, he says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And here's what he Kind of what he said to him, he says that, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, who we know, if you study scripture, that's, that's Peter, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Just, he's just saying some, 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 have, some have died. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, the brother of Jesus, then to all the apostles, and lastly, or last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. He's a, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Now, here's the funny thing about, about what, 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 what he's writing there and what kind of today's world. Y'all ever heard of like old wives' tales? Like, like old wives' tales, like, like, like for one, like, like if you you know if you if you crack your knuckles and stuff like that, what is it going to give your? It's gonna, yeah, right. Okay, really? We don't. I mean, does it? I've been doing it for forty-one years, and my fingers are still good to go. Like, like what? What's the other one? Like swallowing gum? It's going to be in there for a long time, right? Like seven years? Is that what they tell you? Really? I mean, or or like like swimming? How long do you have to wait? After you eat to go swimming, why? Like, really? Yeah, like, like, or like shaving, right? If you shave, what's it going to do? It's, it's going to, yeah, right? Or chocolate. If you eat chocolate, what's it going to do to your face? It's going to give you pimples, right? It, it, it really, like, if you don't wash your face, that's what gives you pimples, 
Like, okay, like, or, or maybe this one. Here's a good old wives' tales that like essential oils really work, right? Like, like, I don't know, but but like, but like, like those are old wives' tales. Like, like, like they just grow. And then, and then, what do we have? We have urban legends that, as the stories are told, they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and they get bigger. Like, like if you go down to uh, St. Augustine, Florida, there's a place. I've been there. I've, I've I've been to St. Augustine, I've been to the Fountain of Youth, right? That's like the place that Ponce de Leon was, when he was, came to America and he rides around Florida just looking for the Fountain of Youth because he always wants to be young and all this, you know. Well, here's newsflash, old Ponce, like, that, it's not gonna, you're gonna get old, right? Or like Sasquatch. Sasquatch. <laughs> like, like, really, like, like, that, like there's this, the, the urban legend that there's this, beastly thing that walks around out in, 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 in the woods and the only way they can get a picture of him if he's like this, right? Like, like that's, is that the only thing we got? Or like Bloody Mary, not the drink, so y'all don't get excited here, but like, but like Bloody Mary, like you stand in front of the mirror and you say this thing, like, is that really, like, come on. Or how about Elvis is alive? Yeah, like, 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 seriously, even if he was still alive, he'd be like 90-something years old. And I've seen his grave. They say he's in there, and I believe him. Like, these are all myths. And, and, like the, and with time, the legend of them grows. But there's no authenticity to this. Many people believe that the story of Jesus rising from the dead fits in that same category. Fits in the same category as these urban legends, as these myths. And some of us are probably like, what do you mean? Like, people actually believe that? I don't know anybody that believes that. Yeah, you do. Sure you do. It's just they're not willing to tell you that to your face, that you're, you know, I'm just going to let you believe what you want to believe. I'm just going to go over here. You do you, and, you know, you're kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs kind of thing. But, but, like, like, but here's the thing. Like, like there are people that, that, that believe this is just a myth. It's an urban legend. And, and we're so far deep into this, and now we just can't recover. We just got to keep going, and we got to keep, keep moving. So what I want to tell you on this Easter Sunday, what I want to show you on this Easter Sunday, that the, the writings of the New Testament, the collection of writings that we call the New Testament that were written mostly by Paul and, and Peter and John and Luke and James and, and Titus uh, were, were, are, are proven to be reliable historical documents. That has already been proven. And I'm just going to show it to you this morning. And if you read the story, the historical document of, of this story, and you look at the story of Christ rising from the dead, there is nothing in this story that I would tell you that we could classify as an urban legend, a myth, or a fairy tale. Because we all know fairy tales do what? End happily ever after. Right? Like, if you look, it's like Snow White, they all, they all end happily ever after. The story as it's written on paper in the Bible, there is no happily ever after in the Bible. There, there is nothing that ends good for these apostles, as we would classify as good. It's not in a land, land, far, 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 far away, right? It's right in the middle of history. When Luke was writing his, his writings, his gospel, Luke was a very respected doctor in that time who had a lot on the line to write some fairy tale. His profession, his career, everything that he knew, everything he had worked so hard, it was on the line when he wrote and, and penned these words to paper. And he starts off and he says... In the time of King Herod of Judea, right in the middle of history. So I want to show you today that the first thing I would tell you about this story is it's very specific. There's no vague details in this. It's very, very, very specific. And the Bible has all of them. Where did Jesus rise? We know exactly where it is. We can go to it today. Well, maybe not today because I may not let you on a plane to get over there, but you could go to it. It is still there. It's not in the land far, far, far away. It's not up on the roof. There arose such a clatter and then all this other, like, like no. Luke tells us in, in chapter three exactly where it is. He says this, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, a real ruler, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, proven these people actually live. Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, 
And his brother Philip, tetriarch of Ituria and Trachonitis. These are terrible city names, I'll tell you that. And Lysanias was the tetriarch of Abilene, in case you were wondering. And during the, during, during the high priesthood of, of Annas and, and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Why is it so specific? Because Luke is saying, hey, look, this really happened. These are the people, the, the places that they were ruling over. Because all he's trying to do is saying, hey, there was a dude in the wilderness that ate bugs and wore camel skin. His name was John. We know him as the Baptist. And, and like, like, that's all he's trying to do. And he's giving us documentation that this is not some fairy tale. This is not Camelot. That this is very specific. This is precise GPS location, time, and place. Real places. We can go look and we can, if, if you've got a Bible and there's maps in the back, it'll show you exactly where these are. Go to Google. They'll tell you exactly where they are. It's a real place Descri described specifically. And there's 30 other historical, non-biblical historical documents that verify every single place and all these rulers and all these people. And it only points to the, legit le the legitimacy of the Bible. All of that points to the Bible being 100% authentic. It's very specific. The next thing I'll tell you is it's very instant. It is very instant. The narrative that Jesus' disciples telling the story of Jesus rising from the dead was instant. It was within 50 days of, 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 the, of his resurrection. The thing about old wives' tales and urban legends is they grow with time, right? Like the longer you get away from the event, the, you know, the fish started out being this big, and by the time you get home, you tell your wife, like, honey, I caught a fish, and it was like, <laughs> I mean, like, we couldn't even get it in the cooler, How do we know anything about history? Right now, in 2021, how do we know anything about who was our first president of the United States? Right? How do we know that? History class, right? Well, how do they know that? Because somebody had to write it down. Somebody had to put pen to paper and say George Washington was the first president of the United States. And, and there's old wives tales about it, right? The cherry tree, right? And you could not tell a lie? That's not true. Sorry. Okay. But, but like we know that because, because it's, 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 it's been told to us through time. How do we know? Like, let's just, let's, that's only a couple hundred years removed from that. Let's go back way far. How, what about Alexander the Great? How do we know anything about Alexander the Great? There's been two biographies that, that, have, that we know most uh, about Alexander the Great. One was written by, uh, by Arian, and the other one was written by Plutarch. And so, so in those bi uh, biographies that they wrote, they tell about how he died at age 32 and he conquered the world by age 30 and that he was tutored by Aristotle and all these things about his life that uh, by the time he was 31, he, he, he set out to conquer everything. He'd already conquered everything. He sat down. He's like, I don't know what to do. I've conquered everything. And he, he started weeping because of that. We know all that because of these two biographies. You know when they were written? 400 years after Alexander the Great's death. Anybody ever been to a college class where they question that? Like, will we question whether or not Alexander the Great did those things? Uh, I've never heard of a college class where they do that. No one's, no one's doubting Alexander the Great and what he did. And so we have the Bible, who this, what Paul was writing to the Corinthian church was, was we have proof that it was written in 55 AD. Jesus died in 30 AD, roughly. 25 years. 25 years from, from the time that Paul was able to, to, to understand the story, read the story, know the story, commit to the story, and write it down. 25 years. Christ died, Christ is buried. Christ rose again. Well, that's not instant, right? It's 25 years. It's a lot better than 400. But here's the thing. If you look at what Paul's writing in this moment, he says, he says in verse one, he says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, which means what? He's already told it to him. So if he's writing this in 55, 
He's, he's telling them, I've already told you this. So it has to be earlier than that. We don't know exactly when he told them. We don't, we don't, that's not, he's just saying, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached, which you received, on which you've taken your stand. So it's earlier than that. Most of the New Testament, the entire New Testament, most of it, was compiled by 70 A.D. By 70 A.D. The entire New Testament was compiled by 100 A.D. So within 70 years, all the writings of the New Testament, everything that they said, all pointed to the same thing, the same person, the same accounts. And everything that was written, what Paul was saying in that, in that scripture that he was writing in, in, in 1 Corinthians, he was saying, hey, look, there's people that are alive that witnessed it. They saw it with their own eyes. Yes, yeah, some have died, but y'all remember it. Y'all saw all of it. And he says, for what I received, I passed on to you. So what does that mean? Essentially, that means that whatever Paul was telling them, he had to believe it first. And if you go over, to, you slip over to Galatians, uh, it tells you kind of Paul's journey and how, how he, he formed his, his spiritual formation and that he took three years out in the wilderness just, just learning and, and, and doing that stuff. And then he came back to Jerusalem and he met with, with Peter. And then he met with, with James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem and who was Jesus' half-brother. And, and so like, and this is where he learned kind of this creed, you know, that Christ died. Christ rose again. Christ appeared to Peter. Christ appeared to the 12. He appeared to 500. He appeared to James, and then he appeared to me. And so, that, like, he's just repeating this. And I don't know, like, it was something that they quoted in church. Like, I don't know if they put it to, like, you know, the tune to the Adams family or what. But, but like, like, they're sitting there. And so, like, they, they already knew this. He's, Paul was just saying, hey, remember this. Remember what I told you. Remember what we're preaching here. Remember what the church is saying. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose again. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose again. It is estimated that within six months of Christ's resurrection that the church was reciting what Paul was telling, reminding the Corinthian church. Within six months. I don't know about you, but that's pretty instant. That's pretty instant. The next thing I'll tell you is that it was specific, it was instant, and the Bible is awkward. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed how awkward the Bible is? Like in some of the things that it, that it right? Let's, let's just call a spade a spade here, right? It's pretty awkward. Like let's, let's just, just look at like Peter, right? It, Peter was the leader of the church and like he was the guy that, that was in charge of stuff and he was responsible for the stuff. And I can tell you that if someone was writing about this and they were making this up, you know what part I'd leave out? The part where Jesus called me Satan. Like that's kind of awkward. But that's not, that's just like the small things that it gets awkward. Look at, look at Mark's gospel. I find this really awkward. So the night Jesus was arrested, this would have been like this past Thursday. They come and they come into the garden of Gethsemane and Mark writes it like this. He says in verse 51, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, seized Jesus, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Like, why is that in there? Like, have you ever, like, like, Really? Mark, like, why, did, why, like, I don't know, because the chapter ends, and then it goes to the next one, like, Jesus before the high priest, and like, that's it, that's all you see of that, and then there's this, then there's this, uh, on Easter Sunday morning, this is what happens, so, so Mary had already been to the tomb, she had already seen that the tomb was rolled away, and there was nobody in there, and she comes back, she comes running, it says this, in, in uh, John 20, verse 2, it says, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples. So, so I'll, I'll give you the first weird, awkward thing there. Number one, um, if you're writing this, in that time, a woman would not have told you that story because weren't, women weren't allowed to speak. They weren't allowed to, to, to address a man. They weren't allowed to do this. And so, so you're not gonna write the narrative from that because they're already not gonna believe it. So that's number one. Number two, John is writing this and the other disciple John's writing about is himself. Like, why can't he write, so she came running to Simon Peter and myself, or I, or me, or like, I don't care what kind of English, like, why are you using the other disciple? Like, why can't you just use your name? You got a problem writing in third person? Like, I don't know, like, like, what is this? 
And then he goes on, he says this, the one that Jesus loved. So he's talking about himself. I'm the other disciple, you know, the one that Jesus really loved. Like, I don't know, maybe, I don't, maybe he had a weird complex about him. And so, so here, it just keeps going. They have taken, this is what she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple, talking about himself, started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So, like, what, is he bragging or, or is he just saying, like, Peter's fat and slow? Like, I don't, like, I don't know. What, what is he trying to say right? Like, that is, like, why are you putting that in there? You don't know why they're putting it in there? Because that's how it happened. Because real life, newsflash, is awkward, right? Like, like real life is awkward. It's weird. If we really, like, were to examine this, like, 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 why is John, like, bragging? Like, he's just like, hey, Peter couldn't make the track team, and, like, so, like, I just kind of outran him and stuff. Like, like, that's awkward. It's awkward. Some awkward things in the Bible. Because it was real life. And it really happened. Next thing I'll tell you is these folks were stubborn. These folks were stubborn in the best Southern English I can have. Like, like, seriously, from the moment Christ arose, people stuck to the story. Stubbornly. They weren't giving in. They, they weren't giving Like, seven weeks after Jesus rose from the dead, this same Peter guy, you know, the slow guy that can't run, Stands up in front of everybody, in front of thousands of people in Jerusalem, and proclaims the gospel, and he wasn't backing down. And this is what he said in Acts 2. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourself know, I love that, because he's like saying, hey, Bartimaeus, y'all remember him? He was blind. How you doing, buddy? You see me? Yeah, you see me good. Hey, Zacchaeus, still up in that tree. About to grow, some, grow a little bit, buddy. Lazarus, ha! Y'all remember him? He was dead. He ain't dead. Like, like, like that's, what, that's what Peter's saying. He's like, he's pointing out, like, y'all, y'all saw it with your own eyes. This is what Paul was saying. Some of you were alive. And then verse 23 says, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, who were the Pontius and Herod and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, put him to death by nailing him up to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And the disciples stuck to this. The apostles stuck to this stubbornly, and they weren't backing down, and they weren't giving in, and they suffered for it. I told you this, the, the happy ending that fairy tales usually end in, it wasn't a happy ending for him. John, who wrote the gospel, John wrote Revelation, was boiled alive and lived. And then he was exiled to the island of Patmos to be alone the rest of his life. Thomas, you remember the guy Thomas? If you don't know, Thomas was, was the doubter of the group. He didn't really believe Jesus. He didn't really believe in Jesus. And then the first time Jesus shows up after his resurrection, Thomas skipped church and he wasn't there. So it's, don't skip church kind of thing because you might miss Jesus. And then the next time Jesus showed up, Thomas was at church and he was able to like, like that guy, he took a spear. That's not, I, that's not my preferred choice. James, the half brother of Jesus, I don't know about you, if you have siblings, what would it take to lose your head for your sibling that claims he's God? Take a lot. I have a sister. It would take a lot. I love her, but it would take a lot. Paul, the guy that wrote most of the New Testament, who hated Christians, killed Christians, was transformed and converted to Christianity, beheaded. Peter, you know, the slow guy. Apparently, he couldn't get away, you know, from the police either. <laughs> he was crucified. And when they were going to crucify him, he says, 
I'm not worthy to die in the same manner that my Lord died. I wish that you crucify me upside down. And they did. This is not a happy ending. And they were willing to do it. And they were stubborn about it. Because I can tell you, if this was a hoax, if this was an old wives' tale, one of them would have given in. Well, people die for their religion all the time. They die, yeah. But these guys were in a position to know that it was false. They saw it with their own eyes. Lastly, I'll tell you this. The resurrection has come under scrutiny and will continue to. It will continue to come under scrutiny. Gospel has been scrutinized since the first Easter. Gospel has been scrutinized since the first Easter. The, the, the excuse the Romans said, when, when they came back and like, all the disciples come and they're like, what'd y'all do with the body? We didn't take it. And he's like, well, no, you took it. Y'all stole it. You're just trying to cover it up. Like, we, don't, we don't have it. Y'all must have it. The disciples are like, well, we don't have it. Well, you must have it. What'd you do with it? And so it becomes like, like the Romans' idea was just poke holes in it. And people have tried. And they'll continue to try. But it always comes back to the same thing, right? Well, he wasn't really dead. That's what, he wasn't really dead. He was just faking it. I don't know about you, but when they talk about execution, and they say that Jesus had a spear put in his side, as Pastor Tanner said last week, they bring the spear close to me. like, okay, okay, that's enough. I'm done. Right? And, and like, like they, the Romans were very good at execution. It was their profession for some of them. And if they didn't do it right, guess what happened to the Romans? They suffered the same fate. And so when they pulled him off the cross, they knew he was dead. As a matter of fact, they went back to Pontius and said, hey, can we have, Joseph of Arimathea, the guy whose tomb he borrowed, went to, went to Pontius and said, hey, can we have the body? We, you know, burial rites, we got to get him ready, and Passover's coming. And, uh, and then Pontius goes back to him and says, are you sure he's dead? And the Roman guard said, yes. We've stuck a spear through his heart. He's gone. So they take and they wrap the body and they put him in there. And then all of a sudden... You, you know, he's just faking it. And all of a sudden, he wakes up. I guess it was those, you know, essential oils that were in the, the tomb, right? And so he just, he wakes up. And all of a sudden, he takes all his linen clothes off. And, and he lays them there. And then he comes out. And he appears to the disciples. And they're like, it is me. I'm risen. And they're like, bro, you need a doctor. Luke? Like, because like, like his eyeball was like hanging out. And all, like, I mean, he was, because he was beaten. But he wasn't really dead. That's what you'll hear. Oh, the hallucination theory, right? You'll hear that one. Like everybody was just dreaming. I don't know about you, but last time I had a good dream. Like I didn't tap my wife on the shoulder and say, honey, come on, join my dream with me. We're in Hawaii, we're on the beach, and it's like two for one. Come on now. Like, no, dreams are individual, so it couldn't be that. Or like the wrong tomb theory. And this was just kind of rude, really, if you ask me. Like the women showed up to the tomb. They go in, they, they see that the tomb, the stone wasn't there, and they say, they asked the gardener, who was really an angel, they asked the gardener, hey, where's the body? And, and he says, well, he's not here. And before they could like really hear what he's had to say, they ran off because, you know, they're women. And they jumped to conclusions like, whoa, he rose from the dead. And all those others, and they go start going crazy. And then they run back. And, and he's like, whoa, no, you didn't hear. He's over. The... He's just, okay, I guess they'll figure it out for themselves. That's, that's actual some people's thoughts of what happened. You see, every, every one of Jesus' enemies have always assumed that there's nobody in the grave. They've, no one's ever said, well, he's actually really there. It always assumes that there's an empty grave. The tomb where the stone was rolled up across it, a, stone, a tomb and a stone so heavy that really no individual person could push it back. A, a, a tomb with a stone on it that was guarded day and night. It's hard to make this stuff up. I don't believe in coincidences. 
And so why do I tell you all this? Why do we say all this? Because all this information, all this uh, evidence, as Josh McDowell puts it, it demands a verdict. And it's a verdict that each one of us have to do something with. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your socioeconomical status, your age, your anything. We all have to do something with this evidence. But the real question we have to answer with all this evidence is, why did Jesus do that? Why? Right? Because we can, we can look at the what. what. What did he do? Yeah, he did this and did that. But when we look at the question of why he did it, that's when it changes things. That's when it changes us. Because I'll tell you why he did it. He did it for you. And he did it for me. Because in those moments while he was hanging on the cross, in that moment, when he cries out and he says, Eloi, Eloi, laba saktani, which is Hebrew for my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, and he hears this and he understands what it's like, the separation from the Father. And he cries out, it is finished. Not I am finished, but it is finished. And his work was done. And it was completed. And then on Easter Sunday, he defeated it. And the reason he did it was because he didn't want you to experience the same agony he felt on the cross by being separated from the Father. Paul continued to write in 1 Corinthians in verse 17, verse, chapter 15, verse 17, he says, if Christ is not alive and you're still lost in your sins and your faith is a fantasy, it would also mean that those believers in Christ who have passed away have just simply perished. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ is limited to this life on earth, then we deserve to be pitied more than all others. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead. And so my question for us here today is what are we doing with that? If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, what are you doing with that? Because it's the greatest news you could ever hear. It means your sins are forgiven, that, that you don't have to experience the agony that Jesus felt on the cross when the Father turns his back. And forsakes him. If you don't call yourself a follower of Jesus, or a Christian, or whatever, what are you doing with it? Because the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead. And that's a truth we can't get around. Andy Stanley said this, and I'll end with this. He said when he was in high school, his history teacher told him that Genesis was false and Exodus was false and the Noah's Ark was just this and just that. And he said, well, he goes, you know, I don't really have the proof to, to, to prove to you of what was false and what wasn't because I wasn't there and all this other stuff. But um, Jesus proved that he isn't in the tomb and he believed those things. And until you rise from the dead, I'm going to believe Jesus because he's proven that. Because proof is Jesus is alive and Jesus is risen. And that's what we celebrate today. Father, this morning, I thank you. I thank you for this time together. I thank you that you've given us this opportunity to worship you. Father, this morning, I pray. Whether you're here in the room or you're online, God, I pray. In your heart, you're asking, what am I doing with this? What am I doing with this?
And look, I, I understand there's always questions. I understand there's always questions that arise and we don't understand this and we don't understand that. And if you've been here long enough, you'll, you'll know that I tell you there's some things I don't understand. It's where faith comes in. So this morning, our question is, the evidence put before us, what are we doing with it? So Father, this morning, on this day we celebrate, as we worship together, Father, I pray we don't leave here without answering this question in our heart. Father, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. Amen. So a couple things before we go. Uh, Once again, happy Easter and thank you so much for being here. If this is your first time uh, with us, we do have a gift for you that you can just go out in the hallway, and, um, and we'd love just to love on you a little bit uh, in that. But uh, also, if, if you have any questions about what we talked about today, and we'd love just to talk with you about that. We'd love just to kind of take some next steps with you in that. I know there's always things that rise uh, on, on days like today, and so, um, and so we'd love just to help you out. And so you can actually text those questions to us to that same text number at 706 706- 979-2438, it's on your screen, and, uh, and we'll be happy to either sit down with you or answer them as best we can in any way in that. Also, hey, we're going to talk about next week, I want to invite you back, uh, we're going to talk and continue on in the creed, and we're going to uh, talk about where Jesus is today. Uh, what happened to him after the resurrection and all that stuff. And so we're going to talk about what he's doing today at this moment in the, the what he'll be doing tomorrow, what he'll be doing the next day, unless he comes back. Uh, and, so, uh, and so I hope you'll come back and, and worship with us again next week. Thank you so much for being here today and happy Easter. Y'all have a great rest of the day and a great week. We'll see you back next week.